I'm Najaswat for Business and I'm joined by Dr. Georgina Bujol Busquets from Spain. Dr. Busquets, please tell me what is your background? Um, hello. Well, first, um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, so, yes, I'm from Barcelona, Spain. I'm a pharmacist. Um, that's what I did for my bachelor. And after, um, after my bachelor, I studied um, my master's in nutrition and public health. And then I did another master in global health, so international health, to have a broader view of what is public health. After that, um, I don't know why, but basically I chose South Africa. And um, this is a question that a lot of people ask me, like, why South Africa? <laughs> You're from Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think it was like the furthest place. I really wanted to be around um, in a unique context. And I think that South Africa had that like special thing of like, you know, diverse cultures. Um, yeah, such a unique context. So I came to South Africa to work for Team Nox for the Nox Foundation. I did my, an internship there. And after that, I got offered a research grant to do my PhD and I stayed. And this was five years ago. And your PhD was in the effects of low carbohydrate, high fat diets on low income households in South Africa. Tell me about that. So um, when I first joined the Nox Foundation, they were running nutrition education programs in low income communities or townships um, around Cape Town. Um, at that point, they were, um, I think they ran like um, around 10 interventions. I joined one of the interventions in a community called Atlantis, mm-hmm. which is like an hour away from Cape Town. And basically, they were um, teaching people how to improve their diets and following the recommendations and following the guidelines of what is a low carb, high fat diet. So basically uh, reducing refined carbs, refined um, vegetable oils and refining um, simple sugars. And basically they were trying to, with this advice, improve uh, dietary behaviors and also see what were the metabolic health outcomes of it. So we know from like clinical trials and stuff, you know, that this diet works, especially for diabetes, hypertension. So um, it helps with people that are either becoming insulin resistant or they are already insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And actually what we wanted to see is, is this actually um, um, something that can work in um, unique um, um, settings like low-income communities. So when I first joined the Nox Foundation, I was um, involved in these programs, and that's where I got the idea for my PhD. Uh, For my project, I only target women Mm -hmm. because we saw that um, that they have higher rates of metabolic health diseases, Mm -hmm. and especially death because of metabolic health diseases. So we really wanted to explore what are the reasons of that. And did you find that your studies suggested that there is scientific evidence supporting the hypothesis that LCHF diets may be effective for treating non-communicable diseases? So um, I would say from the evidence that we have already, yes. What we found in in our study, um, people improve um, a lot of health outcomes and kind of like, um, could maintain them throughout mm-hmm. a whole year, which obviously it's always um, one of the best outcomes that you can find, you know, that the mm-hmm. benefits are going to be sustainable because um, there's no point of like improving people's health and then after one year and the health go back to where it was. So we could see that um, HbA1c, which is um, like a health marker that helps you to see if someone is getting insulin resistant, um, was improving um, throughout the whole year. Also waist um, circumference, they reduce waist circumference, weight as well, also blood pressure, which um, kind of like aligns with the um, findings from other studies. There's a lot of um, aspects that influence food, you know, like culture, tradition, and the way your um, ancestors used to eat, what sorts of food they used to eat, like, I don't know, especially with like really tasty, amazing foods that, you know, South Africa has like desserts and stuff like that, which can be like really high in sugar and stuff. So also providing them with alternatives to that, you know, um, alternatives to flowers, alternatives to bread and also um, helping them um, 
with their with their within their own budget of like you know everyone has different budgets for shopping and stuff so mm. okay with this amount of money what can you buy um that can like help you sustain these dietary behaviors you know so definitely we should we i think we showed that um this diet is sustainable and i feel like sometimes people when they when they hear about low carb high fat because i've i've been asked this question so much you know like how are you going to ask people that, you know, are struggling and they have like financial constraints and stuff, especially in South Africa, where, you know, is the country with the highest inequality in the world. And um, how are you like, you know, how are you going to ask these people to eat this way? But I mean, really, we're just um, helping them and giving them the advice of like um, eating real food. I spoke to Dr. Mark Kukuzela last week and he said that in South Africa, protein which is sort of the most cherished micronutrient it's really neglected in low income households is it mm-hmm. because it's financially unattainable to keep that as part of your diet or or what would you suggest to south africa's government if they were to aid low income households um mm-hmm. in terms of getting the right amount of protein yeah. to to the citizens so- I think definitely um, access and um, affordability are things, aspects that are, you know, um, important to consider. But also I feel like in general with like animal protein, there's like a huge confusion in like the scientific community. You know, we've been like bombarded with this um, news about like, you know, red meat is causing cancer, whatever. So like, I remember like interviewing people at the baseline um, at that point that they didn't know anything about low carb or whatever. And I was asking them like, what is a healthy diet? And they were like whole grains and, you know, eat, don't eat meats, don't eat meat, don't eat salt and whatever. And I mean, actually what we know now that um, there's certain types of assumptions or links between like meat and cancer or like other diseases that are actually not real or not like cannot be generalized, you know, and certain um, populations like population that is um, like a population of people that are suffering uh, metabolic diseases and stuff, they will benefit like so much from actually getting like really like good um, sources of um, animal protein. So I think that um, in general, like there's a little bit of confusion about that. Organ meats are amazing and also and also like fat from meat mm-hmm. we've been told so many times remove the fat from chicken remove the skin remove you know don't eat that fat worse now we already know like this is like healthy fat you know mm-hmm. this is actually something that we need fat is something yeah, that we need fat. um mm-hmm. exactly some people are like oh how are you gonna ask people to eat high fat but we're not telling them eat like a burger with the bread and it has to yeah. be greasy or whatever no we're talking about like good fats, like nuts, um, avocados, um, olive oil or avocado oil, and also the fat of the meat, you know, the fat of the pieces of the meat that you're buying, like don't remove that. Mm. So, yeah, I feel like at, at the end it would be, it, it's a mix of from governments try to um, incentivize um like eat, people eating meat and like kind of like taking the fear out of it like i'm not saying we have to eat meat every single meal mm-hmm. but like you know just reintroduce it then just to close off with at the shortly after lockdown implemented in south africa in march 2020 the government distributed food parcels to low-income households so i'm just going to read the contents of those food parcels It was starch-rich foods, 10 kilograms of maize meal and 5 kilograms of rice, protein source foods, so 1 kilogram of soya, 2 tins of baked beans, 2 tins of fish and 880 grams of peanut butter, 2 liters of cooking oil, 1 packet of tea bags, 2.5 kilograms of sugar and 1 kilogram of salt. So what is the effect of this kind of diet on your immune system? I feel like the fact we're we're already seeing the fact whoever wrote this list was not properly like advised or like they didn't do like a proper research, especially with COVID, where yes, we know so already and we know from the beginning that is so linked to metabolic conditions like 
people there's higher rates of death when when someone had a, a, like um an existing metabolic condition you know and i'm not even talking about like something that was diagnosed but if you were like pre-diabetic for instance you know that it can just be that you have like a uh, um a high weight circumference which is literally like you are at risk of developing a disease you know those people were already like at a higher rate of death or like complications or whatever and this um, wasn't helping at all i feel like yeah i mean um that's again i say about the confusion you know it's very controversial and problematic to actually consider those foods essential you know because it's like what are you trying to do here it's a very complete um, complicated um, issue, of course, because those foods are the cheaper, cheapest. Yeah. And I guess that's the problem, you know. But yeah. those foods are the ones that the, the government, like, um, put, like, less taxes and stuff like that. There's, like, bigger food companies yeah. around that, bigger brands, you know. So, obviously, there's a lot of aspects around, like, mm-hmm. corruption. Who is in, Who is deciding this food? Who is getting mm-hmm. benefits out of this food? But, like... At the end, who who is there? Who is the person that is eating this food? Like probably someone that is already becoming um, metabolically health would be end up getting diagnosed um, for a chronic disease, will end up having to take medication every single day, maybe end up not being able to work because of that. And that creates a huge burden, burden within their household. And, you know, it's a cycle. Mm. So it's the cycle of poverty, which um, obviously health is really involved. And I feel like during COVID, that's that's one of the things that we are realized the most, you know, like who in crisis, in like really hectic um, situations, mm. who can thrive and like survive and who cannot because of, you know, what is available to these mm. people. And obviously, um, with the Eat Better South Africa program, um, one of the um, goals is um, everyone is free to decide whatever they want to do with their money and whatever they have. But at least knowledge has to be available to everyone. Yes, and they've been educated by the Nox Foundation. Exactly. And once you have this information, you go and you do whatever you want with it. This information that so, so many people think like, oh, this is available for everyone. Of course, everybody knows. But it's not true. Not everybody knows. Um, especially w- when you work with communities where in rural areas, like there's a high percentage of people that they don't even know how to read. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality. Mm-hmm.